with certain riders and certain people, but when it's your sure. coach, sure. it has to sting and hurt. How did you react to that? Yeah, it, um, it did. But you know, by that time, I was really, really good at taking um, you know, negative things and just refocusing them. Right? So it, it didn't linger. It didn't, you know, I used those things to help me get up at 4 a.m. So no matter what's said, be it positive or be it negative, it's gonna do nothing but fuel my passion, then you, you really, there's nothing anybody can say that's really gonna take you backwards. Okay, LeBron, you used to be a good guy, and then you turned into a bad guy, and now you're a good guy again? And you left the NBA hanging. What are they going to do when they don't have a bad guy? Exactly what we do. They're going to make a new one. The good part about somewhat reaching unk status is I'm actually old enough to remember significant NBA historical things. I remember precisely in 2010 when LeBron televised his decision to join Miami. And for about two years, he was easily the most hated player in the sport. The Miami Heat basically took the league by storm with the first player-made super team that we've really seen. And although it's celebrated and basically welcomed now, it wasn't back then. It was damn near a foreign concept, especially with players of that magnitude. And fans, the owners, the media, players current and old, nobody really liked it. In 2011, when the Miami Heat lost the NBA Finals and LeBron had one of the most epic meltdowns from a superstar ever, it was insane to see how many fans, the media, everyone tore down and rejoiced over this man's failure. In Braun's first year with Miami, he tried to play into that villain role and admittedly it was a coping mechanism from all the hate he was getting. This is a clear example of LeBron doing just that. In a regular season game versus Portland, a team he has no significant history with whatsoever, this was one of his most dominant games of the year and he damn near got booed every single time he touched the ball. Eventually the game did go into overtime and Braun basically took over. Look at him embracing that villain role with all the boos he was getting. LeBron hits the three. And now gonna go with the crowd a little bit. Look at him walk over to the front row, clear away from the bench and look into the stands, boy. Kobe Bryant rest in peace. His legacy and love definitely grew once he retired and clearly after his untimely demise. But I always say, never forget exactly how much of a villain this man was pretty much for the majority of his prime. Now Kobe definitely had his stance, but he was easily one of the most disliked players in sports in general. Now why? The Shaq feud definitely took a toll on his reputation, off the court stuff obviously did as well. And what we look at now and champion as Mamba mentality now, at that time was looked at as Kobe being an asshole and a fake MJ wannabe before he won those championships without Shaq. Never forget the infamous Nike commercial after Kobe retired. Kevin Durant, eight years ago, I've never in my life seen a player go from being the most beloved, respected, and damn near defended player like Kevin Durant to absolutely hated by the entire NBA world. Remember, two years prior to him joining Golden State, KD had one of the most heartfelt MVP speeches ever. He was literally on the cover of 2K essentially twice, and he was constantly defended heavily for being willing to sacrifice shots and credit with a very polarizing Russell Westbrook. All of that immediately changed with his one decision. These are easily the three biggest villains of my lifetime. And you could throw in a sprinkle of Draymond, but he's obviously not of that magnitude. But the common theme with all of them, through all the hatred, all the bulls, with how heavily despised they were through the entire NBA landscape, through all of that, all of them won. This year's Olympics, and even going back to last year's playoffs, and the playoffs before that, in the playoffs before that, it made me realize we actually have a new NBA villain, whether we realize it or not. And how exactly he handles his career going forward, not in the regular season, not on podcasts, not on Twitter, but in April through June when it really matters.
it will actually determine whether he's the worst villain we've seen because everyone else for the most part like i said they won you've played like one of the last 14 or 15 games you have a tear in your meniscus why are you jumping around on stage like this? Because you got to understand, in your situation, you have to be smart. His judgment is off because a few weeks recently said he thinks he can play 40 minutes a night. So your judgment is not correct. The biggest problem with Joel Embiid to me is that he never seems to be able to read the room. And honestly, the hate and criticism he gets nowadays is very warranted. A few weeks ago, Joel B said something that you can say is objectively true, but he's the absolute wrong person to ever say it. We know Jason Tatum is kinda in a weird position right now career-wise, and I think everyone sees it. Before he even won this year's championship, I made a video talking about how strange his legacy really was, and post winning the championship, it damn near got weirder. Now, Jason Tatum is actually one of the most accomplished postseason players ever for his age, and even individual visually he's building a legacy of an all-time great but it doesn't always feel like it because the team around him is so collectively good jalen brown won both the finals mvp and the conference finals mvp jason tatum fresh off his first championship gets to be the cover of nba 2k25 and awkwardly gets benched in the first olympic game versus serbia joel mb goes on a podcast and says well he wished he had a super team because if he did he'd win a championship too in this case if he goes five for 20 his team gets blown out and the crazy part to me is the fact that he's not all the way wrong but he's also not a hundred percent right First of all, Joel Embiid is an MVP, and even though he doesn't have the accomplishments, he can flirt with the best player in the world discussion. He is that talented. Tatum isn't. So for Embiid to even make that comment in the first place felt extremely weak from a player of that magnitude. And second, even when Joel has had help in the past, he's had multiple moments where he's absolutely gagged the opportunity to capitalize on it. In 2019, Philly had one of the craziest teams on paper, and against Toronto, Joel Embiid had a two for seven game in which they won and stole home court versus Toronto, and a very lackluster 17 point game six in which they were still able to push it to game seven. He was awful in that game seven. How long as the best player do you want to be carried? In 2021, when Philly actually won the first seed, we infamously blamed Ben Simmons for that game seven versus Atlanta. And yeah, that passed up dunk was most definitely a pivotal moment in that game. But down 2-3 versus Atlanta, Joel Embiid had one of the worst back against the wall games you could possibly have, especially from a player of that caliber. Remember, he would have won MVP had he never gotten hurt. In game six, Joel went nine for 24, and he was the third leading scorer on his own team and had eight turnovers. They still won that game. That is literally having help. And in game seven, it's not like he dominated and seized that opportunity. If they lost that game six, Joel Embiid gets the majority of the blame, not Ben Simmons. The help he had in that specific series also helped shift the blame to the low-hanging fruit scapegoat Ben Simmons. So yes, bro, you've had help as well. In 2023, the year he won MVP, and this is where that comment specifically towards Jason Tatum is very funny and ironic. Yes, you can say Jason Tatum gets bailed out at times for not playing like a superstar, but Joel Embiid gets bailed out literally for not even being available and still couldn't cash in against Jason Tatum. Again, as the most valuable player that year, his teammate James Harden played two of arguably his greatest playoff games ever to keep that Sixers team afloat in that series. Game one, when Joel Embiid couldn't play and they still momentarily stole home court and game four with James Harden's 42 piece, even this series two games apiece. Game six versus Boston in Philly, up 3-2, where Joel Embiid could reach his first conference finals ever. Guess what Jason Tatum did? Exactly what Joel Embiid says he has the luxury of doing and still being able to win. He went five for 21. Now this is just me and this is how I look at it. If you're the MVP and supposedly the best player in the world and the opposing team's best player is one for 14 through the first three quarters of that pivotal game six, why can't you as the best player capitalize on that? Why? You're the MVP. You're essentially getting a gift. Jason Tatum is in a massive slump and you still couldn't win at home. What's funny to me is when Joel B actually struggled in game seven in Boston and it was Tatum's turn to capitalize on his gift. 
He did just that and scored the most points in a Game 7 history. The year before that, Jason Tatum played a pivotal Game 6 with his back against the wall in Milwaukee and had literally one of his signature moments. Joel Embiid has never had that, so again, he's the last person to ever speak on Tatum. In the playoffs between these two, you know what Jason Tatum's record is against Joel Embiid? It's 12 and 3. You might be saying, well, Jason Tatum has always had the better team, so he was supposed to win, but that's not true at all. The first time they met, Tatum was a rookie playing without Kyrie and Gordon on this miraculous Eastern Conference Finals run, the run that actually took LeBron to seven games in the Conference Finals. Embiid and Ben Simmons were literally being compared to Kareem and Magic. Look at ESPN's predictions before that series. Everyone had Philly, and they lost in five. So Joel Embiid essentially had two golden opportunities to take down Tatum in the Boston Celtics, and he failed at both. Embiid is the last person to ever jump on any type of Tatum hate funny train. Also, Joel Embiid seems to be what I like to call a convenient superstar, meaning when everything is favored to him to dominate, he does. That's why the regular season now for him is irrelevant because, well, bro, it's Taylor made for him. The regular season is where the refs abuse their whistle. Since 2021, Joel Embiid shoots the most free throws per game and has by far the most points at the line. It's one thing to see 5'11", 6'0", Trey Young foul baiting and stopping mid-drive and people dislike them for that because it's annoying and dangerous. But it's a whole nother story when the biggest dude in the league damn near is recklessly throwing his body around for fouls which could damn near end somebody's career with his size. That's why in this year's Olympics, it almost feels like Joel Embiid is getting exposed. When the rules don't favor him, he clearly struggles. When the team isn't centered around him, he looks lazy, lethargic, and ultimately, he struggles. Him being what I call a convenient superstar can also be used in the Nikola Jokic rivalry. Joel hasn't played in Denver in five years. Five damn years he hasn't stepped foot in Mile High to face his obvious biggest rival. The last two times they played in Philly, it just felt like it meant too much for Joel. And yeah, it's cool. That was the Super Bowl and he had 240 pieces. But again, it was in Philly where everything favors him. Why don't you ever go to Denver? Joel B also recently said if it wasn't for injuries, he'd be one of the GOATs. Every playoff run, somebody is falling on his knee or he's breaking his face, etc. Well, this comment will hold more weight, at least for me, if he didn't spend 50% of games collapsing on the floor and damn near hurting everyone else, and if he had at least one playoff run showing, he could actually perform on the grandest stage. Unfortunately, at this moment in his career, especially past the first round, he, he just doesn't. Bill Walton, he gets that luxury because, well, we've we seen it. Penny Hardaway, he gets that luxury. That comment, to me, it would apply way more to a guy like Kawhi Leonard. Stephen A. Smith is kind of annoying me right now in picking at Kawhi because, yeah, right now his body is failing him, but we've seen multiple times him have the craziest Michael Jordan-like runs in the playoffs. Joel Embiid, yes, we know he's had injuries and those are unfortunate, but basically for his entire career, his production has consistently plummeted in the postseason when it really matters. And going back to Joel, never being able to read the room, to me, if anything, that's what's really made him a villain. It seems like his comments always age poorly and eventually they backfire. Right before he won his MVP, he was trying to take little jabs at Jokic's defense, basically saying the numbers say he played defense, but he really doesn't. And it worked because he did win his MVP. But as Embiid was having one of the worst MVP playoff runs we've ever seen, Jokic was breaking all kinds of records and literally having one of the best runs in the history of the sport. And then right after Embiid had his worst game of the year in game seven versus Boston as the MVP, it was damn near like he got to the podium and started mocking Giannis. This dude never knows how to read the room. Like someone said, um, it was not a failure, you know, steps to success. Um, but yeah, you just gotta, you know, it's tough. I'm trying not to be too hard on him, but even this comment from Joel shows why he's now enemy number one. Basically saying LeBron and some of the older guys on Team USA aren't the guys they used to be. Well, I'm gonna keep it at LeBron, who's 10 years older than Joel Embiid right now. 
in the last three years, and this is obviously Joel's prom, who's really been the more impactful player for their team when it matters most? I'm just asking the question. LeBron has actually played more games for his team. LeBron has actually had the better playoff resume and even in the regular season, Joel shoots more free throws and shout out to him for that because that is a skill, I guess. But despite that, even at this age, Bron is arguably the more efficient, pure scorer. So if he's not what he used to be at this age, that's either telling to his sustained greatness or your supposed prom. I know Joel is the more dominant player at this specific stage, but it was such an out-of-pocket comment to me. And LeBron has been better during these Olympics. Joel Embiid now has his third version of, I guess, a super tight team. And there is really no more excuses. There's no Ben Simmons to blame. There's no Doc Rivers to blame. There isn't even a James Harden situation to blame. He's in his 30s now. They were able to steal Paul George from his hometown LA. If he doesn't win now, or at least make a finals, Karl Malone, Reggie Miller as villains, they did that. He can go down as possibly the worst villain we've ever seen. If you guys like this video, like this video, I just been seeing Joel and B say some crazy stuff recently and I got inspired to make it. Um, let me know in the comment section what you feel about this topic. Follow my social media sites, do all that great stuff, guys. And until next time, as always, stay tuned.